must be one of the most amazing flying stories of all time. One that is still hard to believe. An airliner full of passengers out of control at 17,000 feet. And the pilot is stuck outside the plane. In the cockpit, three frightened flight attendants are clinging to his legs. If he slips from their grasp, the captain's body could be sucked into the engine and bring down the plane. At the controls, a young co-pilot is battling to get the plane to the nearest airport. The lives of 87 passengers and crew hang by a thread. A lot of people go through life thinking it'll never happen to me. But you tend to go through life thinking it can. I said I, said I thought I was going to die, Mother. I thought I was going to die. This bizarre accident tested the limits of human survival. And the investigation that followed not only exposed the mistakes behind it, but led to new ways of preventing them. For the crew of the British Airways flight from Birmingham, England to Malaga, Spain, the 10th of June began like any other day. Old friends about to do a job they loved. Stewards Nigel Ogden and Simon Rogers, along with stewardess Sue Prince, had worked together on and off for years. They're an experienced, capable team that takes pride in its work. <laughs> At Birmingham, um, all the cabin crew and all the pilots, they all knew each other. We were all on first name terms. Simon was a good friend of mine anyway, because we, you know, just go out for a beer or a, a curry or whatever like that. Everybody was friendly to everybody else. The one new member of the group was Alistair Acheson, an experienced co-pilot he'd just driven down from Manchester that morning. Morning, Alistair. Tim Lancaster is captain. He's been a commercial pilot for 21 years. Well, we've got to get started, eh? Chief Steward John Heward arrives to give the crew their final briefing. Morning, everyone. Morning. All right. Is that the uh, first officer? Yeah, just down from Manchester. Mm -hmm. Nice seeing you, face. OK, OK. Malaga. Right, looking forward to this. Uh, right, Nige, you can sit up with me up front and talk rugby. Uh, Sue, where would you like? Over the wing. OK, so, Simon, you're at the rear. All right, now, just a few safety questions. Nigel. Before takeoff, the co-pilot performs a walk-around, checking the outside of the aircraft for anything wrong. In the cockpit, Captain Tim Lancaster reviews a log of the maintenance carried out on the plane the day before. Everything OK? Fine. She's just come out of maintenance by the look of it. Hardly much, though. Just changed the windscreen. Many of the passengers know the flight well and are looking forward to a relaxed trip to Spain. I was going to catch a plane from Birmingham to Malaga to meet my mum. My sister and I were joining her there for a week's holiday, a girl's week. I live in the south of Spain, and uh, two or three times a year I come back to see my grandchildren and also my mother. Um, so uh, everyone lives near Birmingham, so that's the route I normally take, Malaga, Birmingham. These unsuspecting passengers and crew were about to begin an adventure of a lifetime. Seem to have made yourself comfortable. Do right. <laughs> My name is Tim Lancaster. Welcome aboard this British Airways flight to Malaga. Unfortunately, it seemed laid, laid back and uh, laid back quite jovial, really. You know, sort of a, well, it's a lovely day in Malaga, blue sky, sunshine. Sit back, back and enjoy the flight. And sunny, and we still expect to get you there on time. Birmingham Tower, Speedbird 5390. We're ready to start and push. Speedbird 5390, clear to start and push. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now going to take you through our safety procedures and equipment. 
That's his information is for your benefit. We ask you to watch and listen carefully. Clear to start engines. Starting number two. Emergency exits are on both sides. The stewardess um, shows you the emergency exit and, and all the um, emergency gear. And um, of course, nobody's really watching. One chap was quite blase, he was reading the Times, and people weren't really bothering because we've all been on flights, and you know, it's no big deal. The air can be topped up by using the mouthpiece, and there is a whistle for attracting attention. The BAC-111 was known as the Jeep of the Skies, a workhorse that was easy to maintain and had a good safety record. At 43 tonnes, this pressurised hull is carrying 81 passengers and six crew and is now climbing to 23,000 feet. In just over two hours, they should be in Spain. Only a catastrophic accident could bring this plane out of the skies. Alistair, I can see my house from here. Two minutes into the climb, the pilots switch on the autopilot. Tim Lancaster takes off his shoulder straps and relaxes into the flight. Now I went into the flight deck to ask uh, Tim and Alistair what they would like to drink. You gentlemen, like a tea? Please, the usual. Well, one sugar, please. And I said, your breakfast's on. It'll only be a few minutes. Now, almost 13 minutes after takeoff, and at 17,300 feet, they're just 5,000 feet from their assigned altitude. But then, in a split second, everything changes. <laughs> Huge explosion, the captain's windscreen blows out into the sky. Almost immediately, a white fog forms. I saw that really intense. Are you declaring an emergency, sir? Watch all episodes of Ice Pilots. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Beely now. Stomach body-shaking thud. We were just diving, really. And then we started to judder like this. And I, I was a bit stunned. I, did, I thought, well, I thought, oh, God, it's a bomb. Alistair, the co-pilot, is suddenly fighting for control in a 350-mile-an-hour wind. There's no time to think about the captain who's been blasted out of the window by pressurised air escaping from the aircraft. The rushing wind pins Captain Lancaster to the roof of the cockpit. Inside, his legs have jammed the control column forward, disconnecting the autopilot and pushing the plane down into a dive. Alistair Atchison needs all his flying experience now. He's on his own. The captain's body is pinned to the outside of the jet as it hurtles down from 17,000 feet. The throttles are jammed forward, increasing the speed to nearly 400 miles an hour. Co-pilot Alistair Atchison has to take command. While he fights to bring the plane under control, Steward Nigel Ogden can see his captain is being sucked out of the aircraft. And I looked in, the flight deck door was resting on the controls, and all I could see was Tim out the window. I jumped over, put one foot in the uh, captain's footwell, and the other one was down the side of his seat. I just grabbed him before he went out completely. Nigel Ogden holds on to the captain for dear life. Outside, a 390 mile an hour blast of wind at minus 17 degrees centigrade smashes into Tim Lancaster's body. 
The tornado in the cockpit is giving Acheson major problems. Air traffic control can hear his cries for help, but the storm rushing through the cockpit drowns out their replies. The captain's feet are still pushing against the control column, and Alistair is struggling to get full control of the plane. He's now diving through some of the busiest air lanes in the world with the added danger of a mid-air collision. From the cabin, lead steward John Heward sees the chaos in the cockpit and does what he can to help. I looked up and there was Nigel sort of hanging across the seat in the flight deck. In front of me, the flight deck door had fallen forwards Whoa. and trapped itself between the actual door frame and the throttles of the aircraft. So I literally stamped on it twice and it literally broke into three or four pieces. Behind, on the wall of the flight deck, there is a spare seat for anybody to observe the flight or whatever. And I thought, well, if I put my arm through the seat belt there, I can grab both of them and at least we've got some sort of anchor point inside the aircraft. Alistair, who's never flown with this crew before, has to leave them to their own devices and focus on getting the plane to safety. He now has control of the throttles. John and Nigel have wrenched the captain's feet away from the control column. But instead of slowing down, Atchison decides to continue the rapid descent. It will quickly take him out of the way of any other air traffic and take him to a lower altitude where oxygen equipment won't be needed. Staying too long at a high altitude risks oxygen starvation, and this older aircraft is not fully equipped with oxygen for all the passengers on board. The airspeed indicator goes into the red. In the cabin, the two other stewards, Sue Prince and Simon Rogers, are trying to prepare the passengers for what they hope will, at worst, be an emergency landing. They've dived to 11,000 feet in just two and a half minutes. But as they level out and slow down to 170 miles per hour, the captain's body is no longer pinned to the roof and slides round to the side of the plane. Working his way from the back of the cabin, steward Simon Rogers now catches sight of the chaos in the cockpit for the first time. Now the aircraft had got to sort of flying fairly level, Simon came up from the back. Nigel was beginning to get really sort of achy now with his arms, and I knew he wasn't going to let go unless he was sure that Tim wouldn't fly out of the window. We all had fear in our eyes. We were all worried sick because we thought, you know, t either Tim's going to die or we're going to die, you know. That was going through my mind. But it was up to Alistair then, and it was up to us three, Simon and John and myself, to... Hold on to grim death. Mayday, 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 mayday. All I remember is Tim's arms flailing out. His arms seemed about six foot long. And he's, I'll never forget that. His eyes were wide open. I mean, his face was hitting the side of the side screen. But he didn't blink. And I, I, I thought to myself, and I said to John, I said, I, th I think he's dead. I think he's dead. And I said, you and Sile have to hold on. I can't hold on anymore. I can't hold on anymore. I've lost the feeling in my arms. And we decided to put Simon. I said to Simon, you sit in that jump seat and fasten yourself in. With Simon sitting in the seat, we'd freed Tim's legs from between the control column and the seat, 
So we hooked his feet over the back of the captain's seat and then Simon literally put his hands on the top to say he was holding his ankles down. Hey, look, what's going on? We're going to be all right, but I think the captain's dead. <gasps> well, I couldn't believe it, because he just told us what a lovely day it was. You know, blue skies, sunshine, uh, relax and enjoy the flight. And then next minute, he's dead. Simon and Alistair now face one of their most difficult decisions, what to do with the lifeless body of the captain. No words are said, but for a moment, the thought passes between them that the best thing would simply be to let it go. No! Can you hold on to it, please? But Alistair's order isn't simply an act of compassion. Releasing the body at the position it was in, it would have gone close to the upper area of the wing. It could have damaged the leading edge of the wing. Had it gone over the wing, it could very well have gone into the engine. Quite a lot of damage could have been caused by the release of the body. So I think it was a very sensible decision to try and keep him where he was. Alistair has managed to get down to 11,000 feet. Without the captain to help, he's operating the plane's systems from memory and shepherding it around Heathrow, some of the most congested airspace in the world. Seven minutes out of contact with the ground, he's able to hear the voice of air traffic control for the first time. Requesting radar assistance onto the nearest airfield, please. Speedbird 5390, roger. Can you accept landing at Southampton? Speedbird 5390, I am familiar with Gatwick. Would appreciate Gatwick. Alistair wants to land at Gatwick Airport, as he's flown there many times before. But Southampton is nearer. And even though he's never flown there before, he knows he has to get down fast. And I am on 150 knots, requesting radar assistance into Southampton. When you're going to an airport that you're not used to, you normally have uh, charts, let down plates, uh, uh, that kind of thing that you can uh, read up on and uh, um, learn something of the airport you're going to. Um, but he knew nothing of Southampton. He hadn't been there. He had no charts because everything had gone out the window. There was no letdown plates to look at the approach and so on. All the maps and charts blew out of the window with the captain, and only the air traffic controller can guide Atchison. He turns towards Southampton. Southampton, this is Speedbird 5390. Do you read? Speedbird 5390, good morning. Identified on handover from London radar, six miles west of Southampton airfield. What is your passing level? Uh, Roger, sir, I am not familiar with uh, Southampton request. Do you shepherd me onto the runway? When he, when he spoke, he was um, obviously stressed. It sounded uh, as if he was under, under a fair bit of pressure. What is your number of persons on board? Uh, we have uh, 84 passengers on board. Uh, and I think that will be all until we are on the ground. Uh, Roger, that's copied. Um, I've been advised it's pressurisation failure. Is that the only problem? Uh, negative. Uh... The uh, captain is uh, half out of the aeroplane, I understand. I believe he's dead. Roger, that is copied. My feeling was when he told me what was going on, it was... Um one of disbelief because it doesn't actually happen. You know, it's one of these things that you see in films that happens in films, but it doesn't happen in real life. And uh, it was sort of the, the hairs in the back of the neck go up and there's this feeling down the spine, the tingle down the spine, and you think, no, it's not for real, but it's got to be. Uh, flight attendant holding on to him, but uh, request an emergency facility for the captain. I think he is dead. Affirm, what is your passing level? Uh, leaving flight level uh, 5,500 feet on uh, 1090. Roger, that's copied. I'll uh, give you a little bit more space, then I'll turn you on to a heading of 180. Yeah, it's a full emergency. It's a one Rundle contacts the emergency radio. services at the I first opportunity. On board, but I'll let you know. that 
the uh, level from where Southampton is uh, acceptable for a 111. Yes, it is acceptable for a 111, and I'll give you the figures shortly. As long as we have at least uh, two and a half thousand metres, I am happy. I'm afraid we don't have two and a half thousand metres. Neither do Bournemouth. We have a maximum of 1,800 metres. Atchison is concerned that the plane is above its maximum landing weight, being full of fuel for the journey to Malaga. And the BAC-111 can't dump fuel. If the runway isn't long enough, he faces more problems. Whether the aircraft could actually stop on the runway, or whether the tyres would burst, or whether he'd go off, uh, go off the end of the runway. Uh, that's obviously what he was worried about when asking for um, 2,200 metres. 5390, thank you very much. We are uh, three greens and uh, flaps, 45, so we are set for approach, but make it please very gentle. Yes, I will indeed. You are number one traffic. If you think about it, all the airline pilot training is done with two pilots, uh, both compass mentors in the cockpit, one flying the aeroplane and the other one doing all the emergency drills. So what you actually had was the captain hanging out the window, at least one person hanging onto his legs, and Alistair flying the aeroplane with nobody else to talk to. Speedbird of 5390. It's nine miles from touchdown, you're clear to land. Wind indicates 020 degrees at 14 knots. Descent to height to 15 for 00 feet. QFE is 1017. Roger, sir, descending to 1,500 feet. Talk me down all the way. I need all the help I can get. Roger, you'll be able to stop the aircraft on the runway and evacuate the aircraft on the runway. He must have been about six or seven miles from touchdown. And obviously, at that point, I kept talking until he was happy he could see the runway and was happy to continue um, looking out the window and land the aeroplane. Um, at the point he said um, he was visual with the runway, I effectively stopped talking. You need not acknowledge unless requested. It will be an uninterrupted talk down, but feel free to interrupt if you feel you need to. 5390, thank you very much. I have the runway in sight. Thank you, you are clear to land. Do you wish me to continue with any further information? Negative. <laughs> 32 minutes after takeoff, with 81 terrified passengers, a nearly full fuel tank, and the captain blasted out of the window, Alistair Acheson attempts the most difficult landing of his career. At 8.55 a.m., flight BA-5390 makes a perfect landing at Southampton Airport. Immediately, emergency vehicles surround the plane. Firefighters remove the body of the captain and lead the passengers and crew away. I remember seeing the co-pilot, the man who really, if it wasn't for him, would have been on the other side by now, and uh, is walking down the runway very slowly, shaking his head, and he got an ambulance man walking with him with, with his arm round the shoulders of the co-pilot. And the co-pilot was shaking his head as if... I remember that distinctly. I don't know why, but I do.
Alistair Acheson has carried out a remarkable piece of flying, almost unprecedented in aviation history. He has had to pilot his plane without his captain, who has undergone physical stresses that nobody could have been expected to survive. I think these extreme conditions, no one expects to occur in their lifetime. His survival time must have been measured in no more than tens of minutes as he became colder and colder and his body systems began to shut down. Tim Lancaster's body was subjected to a two-pronged assault. The physical violence that his body suffered being blown out of the plane and the extreme cold and lack of oxygen at 17,000 feet. Every 1,000 feet of altitude causes the temperature to drop by 2 degrees centigrade. So the temperature on the outside of the plane would have been around minus 17 degrees centigrade. The extreme wind chill also meant his body was losing heat very rapidly. He would have lapsed into semi-consciousness and then unconsciousness. Uh, and as the temperature, his core body temperature fell, he would have uh, finally died as a result of uh, the, the ex excessive cold in that environment. Despite the trauma that Captain Lancaster's body suffered, there was one final twist to his story. In the Oxfordshire countryside, John Heward and Nigel Ogden are visiting one of their crew members who shared their horrific experiences. Here he is. Hi, guys. John, how are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, mate. Nigel. Come in, come in. Hi. Like an SCP, when you go in, you've got to pretend... The captain of that fateful flight, Tim Lancaster, somehow survived his horrific ordeal. There were no fatalities on BA-5390. Yeah, that's it now, you can go on the three-day cruise across there. As his frozen, lifeless body was removed from the plane, nobody thought that Tim could have survived such punishment. But remarkably, he was slowly beginning to emerge from his horrific adventure. Tim, can you hear me? I regained some consciousness on the ground at Southampton because uh, I remember big red and white things, which were obviously fire engines and ambulances, not people and not conversation. And then my next uh, clear, lucid thoughts are in hospital in Southampton. Over the next few days, all the bits eventually arrived back in my sort of consciousness and I put the jigsaw together and, uh, you know, sort of played the whole story for myself and... Uh, understood what had happened. There was a big bang, a noise of all the air escaping, but I remember watching the windscreen move away from the aircraft and then it had gone like a bullet, it disappeared into the, into the distance. And I think there was an even bigger bang, or there was an even bigger bang. And I was very conscious of going upwards. And, uh, well, the whole thing became completely surreal then, as it would. And uh, I was aware of being outside of the aeroplane, but uh, it didn't, that really didn't bother me a great deal. What I remember most clearly is the fact I couldn't breathe because I was facing into the airflow. And I turned it round and actually turned my body round. I was sort of looking back along the top of the aircraft at that stage and I, I could breathe then. And yes, I, I remember that. I can remember seeing the tail of the aircraft. I can remember the engines going round. And, uh, and then I don't remember much more. Memory stopped at that point. I went down there last year, yeah. but they've changed the airport totally uh, this, now. I'm glad I did it. hold on, because uh, Tim was alive. I mean, he's a very strong man. He must have been to survive that. I wouldn't have been able to survive it. It is, look. Tim Lancaster's survival was little short of miraculous. He'd been minutes away from death. It was Alistair Acheson's flying that saved his life. His quick thinking in getting the plane to the ground in only 22 minutes saved Lancaster from dying from the effects of exposure. And by pure chance, the physical trauma he suffered was limited. It included a bone fracture in his right arm and wrist, a broken left thumb, 
bruising, frostbite and shock. Remarkably, within five months, Tim Lancaster had made a full recovery and was flying again. Of course, the captain wasn't the only one to go through a horrific experience. Battling with the controls whilst a tornado raged through the cockpit was something no commercial pilot could be trained for. If it goes comfortable, so just let me know. The few pilots who are able to understand the experience of Atchison and his crew include these young Royal Air Force trainees. They are being put through a simulation of an explosive decompression in this hypobaric chamber. It duplicates the effects of a window blowing out at 25,000 feet. Individual intercoms. Checked and operated. All connections. Checked and firm. Console checks are complete. Clear to claim instruction of the medical officer. <laughs> to 8,000 feet up, 4,000 feet per minute. The atmospheric pressure is initially set to 8,000 feet. This is the pressure inside the sealed cabin of most commercial aircraft. Anyone can survive this for many hours with no ill effects. Any higher than that, and the experience is very different. Uh, students, listen in. Will all students please indicate with a clear thumbs up that they are ready for rapid decompression? Eight thumbs, rest your thumbs. Students, stand by for rapid decompression. In five, four, three, two, one, now. The mist in the hyperbaric chamber is identical to the fog formed when the window blew out on BA5390. At the instant of rapid decompression, the air in the cabin can no longer hold onto its water vapor, which is then released into the atmosphere as fog. Altitude is stable at 25,000 feet. High hold is enabled. Cross vent is on and you're clear to commence hypoxia training. Good, well done. Good, I've got to commence hypoxia training on students. Seven and eight. Confirm, seven Once eight. the fog clears, then the lack of oxygen at that height begins to tell. OK, let's begin your misery. Start copying these shapes in the right-hand bar, Jim. Without oxygen, at first we begin to see uh, a reduction in their reaction speed, and we see uh, personality changes, much like someone experiences when intoxicated with alcohol. So we see that some students become euphoric, some students become quite subdued, uh, and some students Have begin to develop the forgetfulness. Have a look at the ugliness of your colleagues' faces, see if they get any prettier whilst you're becoming hypoxic, and carry on with the We time. see increasingly impaired performance in our students, thinking is slowed and their reaction speed becomes increasingly slowed until they begin to develop sort of uh, lapses of concentration uh, falling into uh, unconsciousness, and finally death if uh, their oxygen supply is not re-established. The blood is no longer carrying as much oxygen as it was. This is all about you experiencing your personal symptoms and ha having others observe the symptoms in you. Flying alone, battling nearly 400 mile an hour winds, and defeating the possibility of oxygen deprivation, Alistair Atchison's achievement in saving Flight 5390 was outstanding. Even as the crisis was unfolding, accident investigators were rushing to Southampton to find an explanation. On the ground at Southampton Airport, the search for clues begins. Initial investigation shows no distortion to the frame of the windscreen, so this rules out a problem with the structure. The fact that there are no shards of glass also discounts a bird strike. Stuart Culling, senior investigator with the Air Accident Investigation Branch, has little to go on. The windscreen was missing. There was a certain amount of blood around. There was some minor dents and scrapes on the fuselage, as you'd expect if the window had gone past. And really, that was about it, apart from a lot of paper scattered around inside. One of his first clues comes from the log recovered from the plane. He knows the plane had been serviced just the day before, and that a windscreen had been replaced. He immediately pays a visit to the British Airways maintenance hangar at Birmingham. 
I wanted to find out exactly what had happened to the aircraft before it took off. And I'd arranged that I should talk to the shift maintenance man who fitted the, the window. Uh, there was a, a slight problem there because he'd been on night duty and consequently he had finished his shift at roughly the same time as the windscreen came out of the aircraft and he wasn't in a fit state to be interviewed. He needed to get some sleep. Stuart Culling. Good yeah. morning. Good to yes. see you. I was expecting you. Yes, good. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Is this the uh, hanger in question? This is the main hanger. Yes. 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 So in the meantime, I, I, I looked around the facility. Uh, I, wanted to... I made sure that any paperwork and any records of the aircraft had been identified and taken away so they couldn't be accessed by anyone else and waited until he came in. Hello, I'm from the AIIB. Oh. Yes, and this is my colleague. What I'd like to do today is just find out what went on that, uh, during that shift pattern and, okay. and how it went. Thank you very much. Did you notice uh, anything about the window itself, any uh, stress marks that were worrying you? My first conversation with the shift maintenance manager was relatively general, because at that stage we had no evidence that was relevant. Uh, you right. didn't delegate it to somebody else and then uh, check Stuart, it? there's oh. a phone call for you. Just come in. Oh, right. Uh, would you mind if I took this and um, well, come back? So I took the call and found that it was information about the windscreen which had been found near Didcot, and there were something like 30 bolts found with it, most of which were one size short in diameter, one size too small in diameter. It was a crucial error. On some planes, windscreens are fitted from the inside and use the internal pressure inside the cabin to keep them in place. But on the 111, the windscreen is bolted on from the outside. Any weakness in the bolts could mean that the pressure inside the plane would blow the windscreen out. It appears Culling has very quickly found the mistake and the guilty man. Um, I've had some news which I think is very relevant. I've heard from my colleagues who are working on the bolts. They tell me they're the wrong bolts. They're the wrong diameter. Um, no, that's not possible. They're the, exactly the same bolts that I took out of there. Um, He's a professional man. He's very keen on doing things, to his mind, uh, in the interest of the company. And he's suddenly told that he's put a windscreen in using bolts of the wrong size, and he's he's absolutely, he's absolutely shocked. Um, I can show you. I can show you the bolts I got out of there. One thing that came out was that he said, "Oh, the old bolts went into a waste bin in the hangar where he did the job, and they may still be there." So we rushed across to the waste bin and found something like 80 discarded bolts. Yeah, they'll be in here. This is where I put them. These are the these are the bolts, and these are the ones you checked against the new ones. That's right, yeah, I took from the carousel. There's really excellent evidence. Gold, as far as I was concerned. Well, I'll take these away. OK. Right. By comparing the maintenance manual to what the engineer had told him, Culling is quickly able to identify the first part of the sequence, what went wrong the previous night when the window of the BAC-111 had been replaced. We went through the whole chain of events that had occurred, and we found that uh, there were something like 13 different anomalies which um, led to the fitting of the bolts. And had any of these caused him to think, the sequence of events would not have continued and there wouldn't have been an accident. The engineer had come early into his shift and at about 4 a.m. had gone to work removing the old windscreen from the plane. The hangar was full and the plane had been pushed against the hangar door, which made the windscreen hard to reach. Stretched across the fuselage, he had problems controlling his screwdriver. The windscreen that he had taken out had itself been fitted with the wrong length bolts but they were still strong enough to hold the screen in, and it survived without a hitch for four years. But he was a conscientious engineer, and he decided that he would replace the old bolts with new ones when he installed the new screen. He chose not to go to the parts catalogue and look up the exact bolts he needed, 
Instead, he went straight to the parts store. Good morning. Morning. There, he matched by eye new bolts with the ones he had taken out of the screen. His eye match was good, and he found a few fresh bolts of exactly the same type in a drawer. Uh, what I'm after is I need 90 7Ds. I'm just doing a windscreen on a 111 over there, and I need some new bolts. 8Ds on a 111? Well, no, these are 7s. This is a 7. I've just taken it out. We haven't got any 7s anyway. OK. Right, the I'll store manager knew that. which bolts the engineer should have been That's looking for, but the engineer chose to ignore his advice. Instead, he drove to the other side of the airport to find a match for his bolts. It was now about 5.15 a.m., and in a dark corner of the hangar, he continued to search for new bolts identical to the ones he'd taken out of the plane. But in the gloom, his luck finally ran out. He thought they matched, but they didn't. He picked bolts that were just over two hundredths of an inch too narrow for the job. Returning to the 111, he stretched over the plane and began fitting these new bolts. Working at an angle, he couldn't see that the new bolts didn't fit correctly. Signing off at 6 a.m., the engineer had managed to get his work done in time. The plane was now ready to be handed over to Captain Lancaster and his crew. In fact, it was a disaster waiting to happen. The morning of the next day, the 111 was at 17,300 feet. The difference in pressure between the sealed hull of the jet and the thin atmosphere was climbing quickly to the half ton per square foot it would reach at 35,000 feet. This pressure was looking for a weakness, and it found it. For Culling, finding out what had happened that night is only the first step. No one had hidden from him what they'd done, but he knows that he has to go deeper to understand the reasons behind this horrific sequence of events, why the engineer did what he did, and whether this was an isolated incident or the symptom of a bigger problem. Accident investigation, certainly on aircraft, comprises two parts. The first part is what's happened, and, and that's usually relatively the easy bit. Um, the second part is, why did it happen? Why did the engineer ignore procedure, bypass the technical manuals, and ignore yes. helpful advice? Culling's search for the answers was in its own way revolutionary. If we talk to people without giving them a warning, um, we felt we'd get more information, because they'd, they'd be freer to discuss it. If we gave them a formal caution, as it were, we thought that uh, they would dry up. Coffee? Oh, yes, please. Great. How was the journey in? Oh, well, usual stuff. Thanks they decide to talk to the engineer well away from the hangar in a cosy hotel room. Well, thanks for coming in. To gain insight into the methods of the maintenance engineers, Culling then does something no one had done before. He brings in a behavioral psychologist. Is the aircraft normally in the hangar when you're doing that? Uh, Psychologists had been used before to analyze why pilots make mistakes under pressure. It's a discipline called human factors. But in 1990, using human factors in engineering was unheard of. I wanted a, a professional slant on what is really psychological territory. I would hope that as far as the uh, shift maintenance manager was concerned, that it gave him extra confidence that we were trying to be even-handed, and that we were trying to get to the bottom of it. Uh, uh, you know, the parts catalogue. Um, uh, when, you, uh, when you're getting the bolts out, um, do you go straight to the parts catalogue, or do you just sort of...? Um... Not usually. Uh, right. No, I, if I've got a set of screws, uh, there's a set of screws, I, I just go get them out, out of the carousel. Right. Uh, you, you, you find it's easier to do it visually? It was, in that case, easier to do it visually from the bolts you take now? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. they're, they're the same bolts that come out, the same ones go back in, so yeah. same size yeah. bolts, there's no difference. And if it worked before, it must be the right bolts. Yeah, it's just time. replacing like with like, really. Yeah, because it had been flying. We were somewhat horrified that they had... that they had admitted 
those things to us, because after all, we were officially in inverted commas, and they were quite proud of them. We would have thought that had they used such practices, they, they would have kept very quiet about it. If I'd had to go check with the computers what bolts I needed and what parts and how to fit the thing, then there was a good chance it wouldn't have been flying at the time it was meant to be. Good, good. So when you're doing the job now, you're an experienced engineer, uh, it might not be by the book all the time, like you would train somebody who was new. No, I'm not used to that. We've been doing these things for years. Culling was stunned by what he was hearing, but there were more revelations to come. The engineer's dangerous approach was becoming clearer by the minute. You trusted your own knowledge better than the store supervisor's knowledge. Well, I'm an engineer. I got seven D bolts out, so I put seven D bolts back in. That's, well, you know, no problem with that. It's that simple. So you trusted that the aircraft had been flying, so therefore they must have been the right bolts. Uh, yeah, that, that aircraft did lots of hours with that windscreen. Their whole aim was to expedite work through, the, uh, through their station. They had a lot of work coming. It was all done at night. And in many cases, they had more work than they could reasonably handle. And they had devised little stratagems to, to get round that. Culling and the psychologists' insights made their way into the first draft of the report. It said that there were systemic faults in the maintenance procedure in Birmingham. But under pressure from British Airways lawyers, and because they hadn't carried out their investigation following normal procedure, the final report was forced to change its emphasis. Our, by our, I mean the Treasury solicitor or whoever was advising the branch, um, confirmed that uh, under natural law it was, it was unfair to use that information because we hadn't gone through the whole procedure. And so we, we had to remove that from the report. The investigators had never produced an accident report like it. Working with the psychologist, Culling developed a completely novel way of using human factors to explain why this accident happened. They uncovered pressures in the hangar that caused an otherwise proficient engineer to make potentially lethal mistakes whilst being certain he was doing the right thing. This psychological approach took air accident prevention to a new level. Through the sheer skill of the crew of BA5390, as well as a small measure of luck, 87 people are now still alive. As a consequence of this investigation, others may never have to go through the same ordeal. In the aftermath of the accident, the crew were treated as heroes. They received numerous awards, and Alistair Acheson received the coveted gold medal for airmanship. Their colleagues also showed what they felt. One of the most moving things was to go back to Birmingham. As we walked into the airport, the whole of the airport stopped. And all the ground staff and all the checking girls and all that just stood and applauded as we walked through the building. And it was, it was really quite, you know, moving at the time. You sort of wanted to get out of the way so that you could sort of, you know, I don't really want to do this. It's like walking up the red carpet sort of thing. No. <laughs> Their colleagues were applauding a team which had demonstrated the highest form of professionalism at every level. A cabin crew which worked as a team in extraordinary circumstances, and the co-pilot, an outsider who took control and worked alone to bring them all safely down to earth. Each of the crew dealt with their experience in different ways. Tim Lancaster began flying again with BA just five months after the accident. He's retired from BA, but loves flying so much he's now with another airline. You cannot say that. Yeah. She'll shoot you. It was a special day when I, the first day I flew. It, I decided, you know, that was what I was going to do. I was going to make an effort to go back to work and get better. So having made the decision, the rest was easy. For Nigel, the man who ran to Tim's aid and held on to him for dear life, the impact of that day was far more profound. I think about it every day. And that is the truth. I think about it every single day. 
in one form or another, yeah. Every single day. Uh, it'll affect me till the end of my days. Mm. Nigel, along with Simon and Sue, no longer fly. But John Heward is still with British Airways as a chief steward. But even he isn't free of the memories of that day. They were bringing in a, a, another British aerospace aeroplane to, to where I worked in Birmingham. And uh, unfortunately, that window was fitted from the outside. And the layout of the cabin was identical. And when I sat on it, it all came back to you. Um, but for that reason, I've gone back to work at Heathrow and fly long haul flights again because those aeroplanes have got no resemblance to the 111 at all. Alistair Acheson, who is still flying for British Airways, chose not to take part in this film. For each of the crew, the experience will stay with them in different ways. But common to them all is that on that day, their numbers did not come up. Tim explained it very well, actually. And he said, our names were on the page, but we weren't at the top. And I think that was, you know, probably true. just a small commuter plane, buzzing back and forth from one town to another. A journey of 86 minutes, one of many that day. No one could ever have imagined that it would end like this, in drama and in death. Yet in 1995, two pilots with 26 passengers aboard managed to defy the laws of gravity for nine minutes and 20 seconds, when their aircraft in effect lost the use of a wing struggling home like a wounded bird. Help me, help me, hold it, help me, hold it! Race positions, keep your heads down, everyone. Hold on, this is gonna be rough. But when their plane makes a miraculous crash landing with all passengers alive, their ordeal isn't over. What awaits them is even more horrifying. It's getting hot in here! Get me up! Tell my wife, I love her! I have never before or since dealt with so much uh, physical devastation and emotional upheaval and so much sorrow. Flying isn't always glamorous. Regional airlines are like the buses of the air, trundling back and forth from one small city to another. Crews operate several flights a day, working for up to 15 hours. They face interminable ground delays and often surly passengers. If a flight gets cancelled, they don't get paid, but they enjoy their work. Atlanta Airport in Georgia has become one of the busiest in the world. It's the home of a very successful regional airline, Atlantic Southeast. ASA serves every town and city of the southeastern United States with a fleet of 83 turboprops. In 1995, most of them were Brasilias built by the Brazilian firm Embraer. The Brasilia is a high-performance aircraft with state-of-the-art avionics and a top speed of 378 miles per hour. Today, after 18,000 successful flights, this Brasilia will take off for the last time. Take off check below the line. I've got your lights. Captain Ed Ganaway and First Officer decks. Matt Warmerdam have just flown in from Macon, Georgia. Turn the lights on. Going through the departure the checklist, they're now ready for their second flight of the day, flight ASA 529 to Gulfport, Mississippi. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Okay. Flight Hi. attendant Robin Feck has been with ASA for just over two years. Hi there. Her cabin is a cramped space, only 31 feet long. Most of her 26 passengers are seasoned business travelers, ranging in age from 18 to 69. Among them are six engineers, two deputy sheriffs, a minister, two Air Force personnel, and even an aspiring flight attendant. For them, the short trip to Gulfport, Mississippi is a routine journey, but they're half an hour late on their schedule already. Keep 
power set. Auto feathers armed. Panels Captain clear. Ed Ganaway, who's alive. been with ASA for seven years, comes from a family of pilots. He's a skilled and accomplished captain. V1. VR. Pause rate. Gear up. The two men have only been flying together for four months, but get along well. At six foot three and 200 pounds, Matt Warmerdam is a tight fit in the Brasilia's cramped cockpit. I think all pilots would agree that the Brasilia was a constant love-hate relationship. It, uh, it was, at the time, the fastest, sleekest turboprop around. And, uh, and it was also very tricky to master. The thing was built like a Sherman tank. Hey, Robin. Hi. It'll just be a couple more minutes like this. It's going to smooth out. Oh, uh, OK, just a couple more minutes and I'll be able to get up? Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. David McCorkill is a frequent flyer and works in the software business. He's on his way to an important meeting. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome aboard Atlantic Southeast Airlines, flight 529, service to Gulfport, Mississippi. We're passing through 13,000 feet. The captain has turned off the fastened seatbelt signs. However, if you are in your seats, uh, we suggest that you do so with your seatbelt loosely around your waist, just in case we encounter any turbulence en route. Chuck Fisterer, a nervous flyer, works for a paper company and is on his way to visit a new mill. ASC 529, climb and maintain flight level 200. 200, AC 529. 20. The Brasilia, on autopilot, is climbing towards its cruising altitude of 24,000 feet. 24. 24. But the plane will never make it to this altitude. Autopilot, engine control, oil. The sound of that Autopilot. was engine. tremendous. It was as if someone had taken a baseball bat and hit an aluminum garbage can as hard as they could. It was just a, a gigantic crashing Autopilot. sound. And the airplane oil. immediately lurched to the left. I heard a, a loud bang, and that's what you know just shot me out awake. Not knowing really what happened, I, I looked over and noticed everyone looking left out the window. What I saw was very alarming. The outer skin of the engine had been ripped off or, as I determined later, had peeled back because of some force. I could see the, the components of the engine itself, and I could see fluid leaving the engine and exiting uh, the back of the wing. Autopilot. Warning lights and chimes go off, signaling Autopilot. trouble in the left engine. The autopilot trips off as a result, and Ganaway takes control of the plane. Autopilot. Engine control. Oil. The plane is falling 5,500 feet a minute, the equivalent of over 90 feet every second. Oil from the destroyed engine is seeping into the air conditioning pack, bringing smoke into the cabin. Back off. We've got the left engine out. Left power lever. Flight idle. Unaware that the left engine is destroyed, the pilot tries to adjust its propeller to improve the plane's lift. Left condition lever. Left condition lever. Feather. Warmerdam attempts to feather the propeller, which means changing the angle of the blades in order to minimize air resistance. The warning light indicates fire in the left engine. Left condition lever fuel shut off. No matter what Ganaway does, the plane is still pulling violently to the left. 
He struggles to counteract it by pushing hard to the right, using both rudder and control column. I need some help here. I need some help on this. The force of the crippled wing pulling to the left is relentless. Without the efforts of the pilots to keep the plane stable, it would roll into a spin and spiral down into the ground, killing everyone on board. The engine has turned into a mass of misshapen, twisted metal, fatally weakening the wing's aerodynamic capabilities and dragging it down. The plane wants to keep turning left. The pilots must push hard right on the rudder to the limit to keep them flying straight. Captain Ganaway is confused. Feathering the propeller has not reduced the drag. He's so preoccupied with handling the emergency, he hasn't looked over his shoulder at the damaged engine yet. You said it's feathered? It's feathered. The hell is wrong with this thing? I don't know. For now, the pilots are focused on the plane's vital statistics. Heading, altitude, speed, and the power setting of its one good engine. These planes were designed to fly with one engine. The airplane is capable of flying on one engine. However, in the case of 529, not only do you have an engine that has malfunctioned and stopped running, but now it is broken from its normal mounted position and canted, which creates a very uh, increased or, or dramatic aerodynamic effect on the airplane. Let's close these. Oh, sir, you don't need to be looking at that. My reaction was, the hell with you. If I want to look out the window, I'm going to look out the window because these are the last moments of my life. Whoa, it's all right. That's just what turbulence feels like with one engine. Are we going to make it? Oh, sir, of course we're going to make it. How can the plane fly like that? Well, these planes were designed to fly with only one engine. We're not going to make it. What was important wasn't the conversation between the two of us. I think that it was what was in our eyes. I think that she knew that I knew that this was a huge problem and that it probably wasn't going to be uh, something that was going to end without tragedy. The pilots have managed to slow the plane's catastrophic rate of descent, but not halt it. In fact, the airspeed has actually increased to 224 miles per hour. Captain Ganaway is puzzled. He's flown a Brasilia on one engine before and landed it without difficulty. This plane has something very wrong. Atlanta Center, AC-529 declaring an emergency. We've had an engine failure. We're out of 14-2 at this time. AC-529, roger. Left turn direct Atlanta. Flight 529, now flying over Alabama, makes a left turn back towards Atlanta. But the airport is almost 58 miles away. Will they make it? The plane has begun to descend again and at breakneck speed. Warmer Dam cancels the master caution warning, finally silencing the plane's alarms. Captain Ganaway experiments with his controls, trying everything. Suddenly, the nose of the Brasilia lifts up and the plane's speed slows to 186 miles per hour. AC-529, say altitude descending to? We're out of 11,600 at this time, AC-529. All right, it's getting more controllable here. The engine, let's watch our speed. For the first time since the crisis began, the pilots can now turn their attention to the passengers. Trim completely here. I'm gonna tell Rob what's going on. Okay, we had an engine failure, Robin. We declared an emergency. We're diverting back to Atlanta. Go ahead and brief the passengers. This will be an emergency landing back in. All right, thank you. Feck hasn't told the pilots what she's seen of the destroyed engine. She assumes they already know. AC-529, can you level off or do you need to keep descending? The plane is descending again at about 3,000 feet a minute. Ganaway suddenly realizes they won't make it to Atlanta. We can we're going to need to keep descending. We need an airport quick. Uh, OK, uh, we're going to need to keep descending. We need an airport quick. Roll the trucks and everything out for us. AC-529, West Georgia. The regional airport is at your 10 o'clock position and about 10 miles away. But the air traffic controller, too preoccupied with handling the crisis aboard Flight 529, fails to notify emergency services. 
Flight 529 makes another wide left turn that brings it on course to land at West Georgia Regional Airport. Let's get out the uh, engine failure checklist, please. Yeah. Uh, engine failure in flight. But they don't get a chance to diagnose their problem. Uh, AC 529, say heading. Uh, turning to about uh, 310 right now. AC 529, Roger, you need to be on a 030 for West Georgia Regional, sir. Roger, we'll uh, probably turn right. We're having difficulty controlling right now. You see your brace positions. Brace position. Good. Good. Ma'am, do you accept responsibility for opening the door when the plane stops? No, okay. Um... Available start. You want me to start it? We gotta bring this thing down. Put that off. Get get bring the ice off. Caution. Caution. AC 529. Uh say your altitude now, sir. Uh out of 7,000, AC 529. Trim fail. Trim fail. Oh, good start. AC 529, I missed that. I'm sorry. We're at a 6.9 right now, AC 529. Okay, it's up and running it. Alright, go ahead. Caution. AC 529, West Georgia Regional is your closest airport. What kind of runway they got? Uh, yeah, what kind of runway is West Georgia Regional got? West Georgia Regional is, it's 5,000 feet. And is asphalt, sir. Okay, now I want you to remove any pans or sharp objects from your pockets. I want you to take off your glasses and pour any drinks into the pocket of the seat in front of you. We had to put the drinks in our pocket in front of us. I think that shook a, a few of us. And I, I kind of noticed it wasn't uh, going too well, but most folks on that flight were business folks that flew real frequent. So, you know, there was no screaming or panicking or, of any sort. Based on the fact that I was gonna die, I dealt with it in the best way that I could, which was just to try to absorb it, accept it, and deal with it. Okay, Mom, practice. Take your seatbelt off and on, okay? That's it. Okay, if there's smoke and the door in front of us is blocked, you gotta get down on your hands and knees and crawl to the back, okay? So count the rows. We gotta get out of the fifth row. The plane is still losing altitude far too quickly. Can it make it to the airport in time? Atlanta Center normally only controls flights at altitudes over 11,000 feet. For the last seven minutes, Flight 529 had been under this altitude, and now the controller is having trouble locating them. AC 529, I've lost your transponder, say altitude. Uh, we're at a 4.5 at this time. AC 529, I've got you now, and the airport's at your... Say, say you're heading now, sir. Uh, we are heading 080. Roger, you need about 10 degrees left. West Georgia Regional Airport is only eight miles away, beneath the clouds. Two minutes flying time, but they're not sure they can keep airborne that long. Uh, I'll tell you what, let me put you on approach. He works that airport and we'll be able to give you more information. Contact Atlanta Approach at 12.0. Atlanta Approach Air Traffic Control. It monitors planes within a much smaller airspace, including West Georgia Regional Airport. The Brasilia, now at 3,400 feet, has slowed its descent to 1,800 feet per minute, but that's still too fast. They won't make it to the airport. On some passengers' faces, looks of despair. Others are angry and bitter, but most are thinking about their loved ones. One woman writes a goodbye note to her children on a torn book cover. She writes, I love you. You are the lights of my life. Always, mommy. We should pray. 
seven minutes have passed. For the first time, Captain Ganaway manages to catch a glimpse of the left engine. The engine's exploded. It's just hanging out there. This was something his instruments hadn't told him. It's no simple engine failure. The engine is just dangling off the wing. He knows he could land a Brasilia with a failed engine, but not when it's torn apart. This is something his training hasn't prepared him for. He wishes he could see through the clouds. Atlanta approach, AC 529. AC 529. Atlanta approach here. Yes, sir, we're with you declaring an emergency. AC 529, roger. Expect localizer runway 34 approach. And could you fly heading uh, 180? Uh, no, sorry, uh, 160. Localizer frequency. The controller's flight path will take the Brasilia several miles south before landing. Ganaway knows he doesn't have the extra minutes that this will take. We can get it in on a visual. Just give us the vectors, we'll go the visual. He asks for directions to take the plane straight in using the shortest possible route. Suddenly, they're out of the clouds, but the sight that greets them couldn't be worse. In front of them, no airport, only forest and villages. Captain Ganaway, who never stutters, does now. S single engine checklist, please. Where the hell is it? Robin Feck is puzzled. Six minutes earlier, Warmer Dam had told her the plane was turning back to Atlanta. But all she can see now is Georgia countryside. We're at 1900 at this time. We're below the clouds, tell them. You are at 1900 now? Yeah, uh, we're VFR at this time. Could you give us a vector to the airport? Turn left. Fly heading 040. Bear the uh, airports at your about 10 o'clock and six miles, sir. Radar contact lost at this time. The plane's low altitude shocks the controller. 1,900 feet. Only a minute earlier, it had been at 3,400 feet. The descent is far too fast. Remember, brace yourselves. And once we get out to where we're going, wait till the plane comes to a complete stop before we can get out. Okay, brace positions, please. Brace positions. Sir, heads down, heads down, please. Robin Feck, too preoccupied by the safety of her passengers, looks out of a window and suddenly sees the tops of the trees. She has but a few seconds left to strap herself in her jump seat before impact. Race positions! Keep your heads down, everyone! Hold on, this is gonna be rough! The airport is only four miles away, but too far for the crippled plane. The pilots have to attempt a crash landing in a field. Oh, behold it! Over there. Hold it, help me, help me, hold it. The plane's altitude voice alarm sounds, warning the pilots that they're flying too close to the ground without their landing gear lowered. Fucking land the plane! The pilots will attempt to land on the plane's belly. Help me, help me, help me hold it, help me hold it! Amy, I love you. These are the last words on the cockpit voice recorder. The plane is flying at 138 miles per hour and only seconds away from impact.
The plane had landed in a small field in Burwell, a sleepy farming community near Carrollton, Georgia, where nothing major ever happens. Many neighbors witnessed the plane coming down. Bill Jetters and his wife lived in this house at the end of this field, angled directly in the plane's path. My wife was sitting at the kitchen table, reading. And uh, she said, Bill, we better get out of here because the plane's going to hit the house. So uh, about that time, it started stopping. I said, well, you call 911, and I'm going to see if I can help with the plane. Yes, we have a plane crashed in our backyard. A plane crashed? Yes, somebody out here. Eight minutes had passed since First Officer Warmerdam had declared an emergency and asked Atlanta Center for rescue vehicles to be alerted. But the controller hadn't passed on the message. Minutes would make the difference now between life and death. The local emergency services responded quickly but were still many miles away. For almost a minute after impact, there's an eerie silence. The plane fuselage is broken in two. Could anyone survive? As the dust settles, <coughs> all 29 people on board are miraculously alive, with only a handful seriously injured by the impact. It was an amazing situation only because uh, I just couldn't even believe that I was alive at that point, and I couldn't believe uh, that I was looking at something that, uh, that was real. But a new disaster is gathering. Fuel from the shattered wing tanks is pouring onto the ground. The last thing I remember is, is the sound of hitting the trees and then I honestly don't recall impact. Captain Ed Ganaway has been knocked unconscious by a blow to the head during the impacts. When First Officer Matt Warmerdam regains consciousness, he realizes they're stuck. The cockpit door is jammed and smoke is slowly seeping in. He reaches for the emergency crash axe. The cockpit window is the only way out. The next immediate thought I had was now we're gonna blow up. So get out of there. He was burning, you know, right in the opening. You know, so I just jumped over. And I headed towards the opening and I walked out of the aircraft and I walked away from it. The sparks ignite the fuel vapors, creating a blazing fire. Within seconds, the fire spreads to the fuselage. In the rear section of the plane, the passengers are now trapped by flames burning at 1,800 degrees centigrade. They can hear screams from the field outside, where some passengers are already suffering from terrible burns. To escape, they too have to run through the fire, not fall in it, hoping for the best. I turned back, and I looked at the aircraft, and what I saw was that the opening that I had come through was basically fully engulfed in flames and that the people that were exiting the aircraft were all on fire. Some of them would, you know, roll in the grass to try and put the fire out. And sometimes that uh, made it worse because it was spent or spilt fuel. And then they would get even more ignited. And the whole situation got uglier and uglier in the sense that it, you would all of a sudden see people with their clothing burned off. You would see people with, 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 uh, with red, uh, red skin that you could see was burnt. You could actually see some people whose flesh uh, was like dropping off of their bodies or their faces. Um, it, it, was, it was just a horrible situation that was taking place and it was getting worse and worse. <laughs> Matt Warmerdam, his right shoulder dislocated, is banging the axe against the window with his left hand.
person's uh, clothes were on fire and she was on the ground. I think it was a woman. She was on the ground and Robin uh, said to me, she says, uh, take off your shirt, take off your pants, try to beat the flames out. And I did that. One gentleman I saw was uh, crawling, completely engulfed in flames. And another one that was, uh, most of his clothes was torn off. Now, whether they got torn off in the crash or uh, he tore them off himself, I don't know. I helped him away from the airplane and brought him up towards my brother-in-law's house. And uh, all he had on was his shorts and uh, his skin was, uh, excuse me. Well, being a paralyzed person myself, I knew that I couldn't do much for them. I was looking and I thought to myself, well, that'll be the, these people that are on that airplane are seeing the last seconds of a normal life that they'll ever live. Aircraft glass is much thicker than what you would see on like, a, like an automobile windshield. It's uh, several different composite layers that have been temper treated together to make it a very, very tough surface. And with each swing of the crash axis, I was only able to chip away a small piece of glass. I need some help! I really did feel kind of alone there. I'm looking around left and right and there's, there's no other fools that close, you know, I, at that second. But even though passenger David McCorkle believes that the plane might blow up at any second, he goes to Matt Warmerdam's rescue. Can you help me? I haven't got enough room inside to swing it. Uh, uh, in here. Uh, uh, oh. Hang on a second here. Hang on, I gotta get some air. The oxygen cylinder in the closet behind the co-pilot's seat punctures. It'll make the cockpit fire much worse. Okay. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, stop a second! Let me see if I can squeeze that. Uh, 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 let's get started. Uh, stop pulling me! No, no, it's too small. Go ahead. By now, the rescue crews of the area have been notified. Firemen, police officers, paramedics, all are hurriedly on their way to the crash site. Will the fire trucks arrive in time to save Matt Warmerdam before the cockpit gets engulfed in flames? David McCorkle is exhausted trying to break the strong glass. Suddenly, a heat flame pops at him from below the cockpit. He backs off, scared for his life. You aren't gonna let me die, are you? He has children, and he must think of them as well. How can he sacrifice his life for a man he does not know? Now more determined than ever, he bangs even harder and faster. Then suddenly, the weakened axe head flies off. It's getting hot in here! Get me out! Guy Pope, a police officer, is the first rescue worker to reach the burning plane. I was about three miles from here when I received the call. And about halfway here, I could see the smoke, pretty heavy smoke. And I got out of the car, and I ran up to the plane. And when I went around the nose of the plane, uh, one of the passengers handed me a hatchet uh, and said that the pilot was inside. And uh, I took the hatchet and uh, started trying to cut a bigger hole. I couldn't get around behind the cockpit because of fire. It was still burning pretty heavy, and there was an oxygen bottle there blowing the fire. And, uh, you know, it, it's just one of them things. You, you, you see a man burn, uh, you, it's, you don't forget it. This is live footage taken with a video from the windshield of a Georgia State Patrol police car as rescue workers are arriving at the site. At this moment, all passengers are out of the two sections of the broken plane, 
except pilots Ed Ganaway and Matt Warmerdam, who remain prisoners of their cockpit. Well, first off, I had to tear the back of the cockpit out. It had burnt, and there was no door or visible door or anything like that. So I actually took my hands and tore it out. When I started to pull him out, he looked up and he said, tell my wife, Amy, that I love her. I said, no, sir, you tell her that you love her, because I'm getting you out of here. Inside the ambulance, I worked with him, and I thought that probably he would not make it. I took his name badge and pinned it on his underwear, which was the only thing I'd left on him, trying to cool him down, because I thought that if he died, at least someone would know who he was. Surprisingly, Matt was aware of everything around him, and he kept trying to assure me that things were going to be OK. He was comforting me, because at that particular time, I was crying. Matthew actually took his burned hand and wiped a tear away. They found Captain Ganaway dead in the cockpit. He had struck his head on impact and never regained consciousness. He died of burns and smoke inhalation. The crash survivors, some with broken bones and others with burns ranging from minor to 92%, are rushed to various hospitals in Georgia. 13 passengers were brought to Tanner Hospital in Carrollton 15 minutes away, where code black was immediately applied, meaning everybody helps. Dr. Bobby Mitchell, after working a night shift, was awakened. He was responsible for treating four survivors, including flight attendant Robin Feck. When I got to the hospital, some of the people uh, that had survived the plane crash were, were already here. The smell was initially just a wave of uh, jet fuel that just hit you as the door opened, and then that was mixed with just a pungent, uh, horrible odor of burned flesh. Ms. Feck, she had a cut on her scalp and uh, a couple of broken bones, like a collarbone and an arm. And she was in a great deal of pain herself, although she, she didn't particularly want me to be dealing with her. She said, you get back with them. And the orthopedist soon took over her care. She was clearly still trying to care for her passengers. When a, a patient suffers a severe burn, the skin is violated. And the skin really is the major part of your immune system. So people that have been horribly burned, that, that initial defense is violated. And infection, infectious organisms, organisms harmful to the body can very easily get in. And your immune system can just handle so much. When they are able to survive for a period of weeks, it is not uncommon for them to die from other organ failure, which is what happened to a lot of the people that were on Flight 529. I have never before or since dealt with so much uh, physical devastation and emotional upheaval and so much sorrow and horror and sadness in one place at one time than, than we did on that day in this, this little small town hospital. After a long day treating the horribly burned passengers and witnessing the courage of some of them, Dr. Mitchell was asked to assist the autopsy on Captain Ed Ganaway. I looked down at him and kind of put my hand over on, I told everybody, I, th I hope wherever his spirit is that he knows what a good job he did. And, and I just said, you know, you're the hero. I hope you know it, Captain Ganaway. Regional airlines are a North American phenomenon. In the early 1960s, a small band of independent airlines first became known as air taxis, which in time became commuter airlines, then finally regional airlines. In 1978, the US deregulated the airlines, and as the small and mid-sized cities became the economic engine of the country, regional airlines prospered as never before. The National Transportation Safety Board in the United States is responsible for investigating air disasters. Its GO team is on duty 24 hours a day to fly to the scene of any major crash. The NTSB will have several subgroups working at the same time, each examining a particular part of the plane. Gordon Jim Hookie, an aerospace engineer, was in charge of the propeller maintenance group. We went out to the crash site, and in the usual fashion, um, you just kind of look around and get a feel for where all the pieces are. We came along the um, propeller assembly that was missing. Looking down through the dirt, we could see the telltale marks, the beach marks 
around along the fracture surface that indicated it might have been a fatigue fracture. During the last 10 minutes of Flight 529, no one on board the plane suspected that the engine failure had been caused by a propeller blade fracture. Hooky had good reason to be concerned by the broken propeller blade. He'd seen it all before. Four years earlier, another ASA Brasilia had nosedived and crashed in woods in Georgia, killing all 23 people aboard, including former US Senator John Tower of Texas and space shuttle astronaut Manly Sonny Carter. The NTSB's investigation of that incident had found the crash had been caused by a badly designed propeller control unit, and they blamed the manufacturer, Hamilton Standard. Then in March 1994, just 17 months before ASA 529, on two separate commercial flights, identical propeller blades broke from metal fatigue over Canada and over Brazil. In both cases, the aircraft involved managed to land safely. These accidents pointed to serious problems in Hamilton's standard propellers and became a major crisis for the company. Airlines were ordered by the government to carry out an inspection of all the 15,000 propeller blades in service. Investigators found that the broken propeller had been declared suspect and sent back to Hamilton Standard for inspection. When the ASA mechanics took the, um, the blade off the, the hub, as soon as they turned it over, we marked down uh, the serial number. So when we went back to do the records, we could immediately go to that particular blade. Investigator Jim Hookey took the broken blade stub to Atlanta Airport. From there, it was sent to the NTSB laboratory in Washington. By next morning, blade number 861398 was being examined under a scanning microscope. Investigators found telltale deposits of chlorine, a corrosive substance known to eat into the inner walls of the propeller blade. So then the question becomes, um, where did the chlorine come from? In two of the previous propeller failures, the problem had also been traced to corrosion caused by chlorine in the inner wall of the blade. Flight 529's blade had also snapped off 13.2 inches from the hub, very similar to the two previous blade failures. Under the microscope, NTSB scientists saw that two cracks along the inner wall of the blade had joined to form a single fissure. This had grown and grown until it circled the blade, at which point it snapped under the stress of normal operation. But the NTSB scientists noted something else. On the inner surface, extending about one and a half inches from the fracture, there was a series of sanding marks. Hookie set off to Hamilton Standard, intent on getting the maintenance records for the propellers. What had been done to the blade when it had been recalled? At the factory, Hookie examined the blade's repair reports. He noted the initials of the technician who did the work, CSB, Christopher Scott Bender. He was a young technician who worked at a Hamilton Standard propeller repair facility. Christopher Bender had watched the news of the accident on television, little realizing how he was involved in the accident. I saw the Hamilton Standard prop on it, and I was like, I hope this is not a prop failure. Uh, it was just kind of the back of my mind, and in that morning, they were like, you know, the NTSB is down there, FAA is investigating, uh, and they've called in some of our engineers to go also down there, and it, it might be a prop failure. Uh, and as soon as I heard that, my heart just sank. I was like, you know, I, I think I might have even cried a little bit because I was just, you know, just emotionally overwhelmed that, you know, something I had put my hands on, a procedure that somebody trusted me to do failed. Uh, and because of that, somebody had died. After discovering the technician who had last worked on the propeller blade that caused the crash of ASA 529, the NTSB now had to find out how the blade had passed inspection. Propeller blades are hollow. Inside, weights are inserted to balance the prop. They're kept in place by a cork soaked in chlorine. It was the chlorine that had caused the corrosion in the previous accidents. However, on this blade, Bender had been unable to detect any evidence of corrosion. He then did what he'd been told to do, polish the inside of the blade. The draft accident report we present to you today involves Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529. And the NTSB found that by polishing the blade, Hamilton Standard had unwittingly removed all traces of the crack, and a later, more thorough ultrasound examination couldn't detect it. The NTSB asked for more accountability for management at Hamilton Standard. And so the final report read, 
The fracture was caused by a fatigue crack from multiple corrosion pits that were not discovered by Hamilton Standard because of inadequate and ineffective corporate inspection and repair techniques, training, documentation and communications. Some final questions still needed to be answered. Why had the broken propeller blade destroyed the engine? In previous incidents, the entire propeller had fallen away harmlessly. But on flight 529, blade loss unbalanced the propeller and led to uncontrollable high-speed shaking as the engine shuddered in its mountings. This was the ominous hammering sound heard by the passengers. It literally ripped the engine open and left the useless propeller jammed against the wing. The flight crew weren't handling the engine failure as a, a true engine failure in that some mechanical malfunction occurred and the engine stopped running. They didn't know that the engine actually had vibrated significantly and broken from its mount and actually canted or twisted on the wing. The NTSB found that the rescue services might have arrived more quickly if controllers had heeded Matt Warmerdam's request for help on the ground given by radio six and a half minutes before the crash. Another key NTSB recommendation was to replace the flimsy crash axe that had failed in Warmerdam's rescue with a sturdier model. Investigators praised the crew of Flight 529 for the way they dealt with the crisis, calling their reactions reasonable and appropriate. But the board could offer little advice on the one thing that had caused all these deaths, fire. The conundrum is, how do you make a fuel burn in an engine but not ignite when it's spilled? One way to reduce the severity of post-crash fires is by utilizing less flammable fuel. In 1984, the Federal Aviation Administration and NASA decided to test a new, safer fuel by staging an accident using a remote control plane. Unfortunately, it was not a conspicuous success. But the US Navy has been using a safer form of jet fuel called JP-5 since the 1950s, yet it's not used in commercial aviation. The primary reason that uh, civilian sector commercial aviation has not gone to a lower flammability fuel is a question of availability and distribution and the cost. It costs more to produce the JP-5. Everything comes down to money. What's it going to cost to develop a system? What's it going to cost to implement the system? What's it going to do for the overall safety of the airplane and who's going to pay for it? Personally, from a safety standpoint, I'll pay $2 extra in my ticket to know and to have that security. Until a solution is found, there will continue to be stories like ASA 529. On impact, everyone on this flight had survived, but the subsequent fire became the killer. For the victims of the fire, recovery has been a slow, painful, and excruciating process. First Officer Matt Warmerdam was burned on 42% of his body. Some other survivors suffered up to 90% burns. Treatment included daily baths and removal of dead skin from burn wounds. There would be years of skin graft operations, the 24-hour-a-day wearing of pressure garments to minimize scarring, chronic itching and soreness, and daily physical therapy. Your ability to sense and feel through those areas is permanently changed uh, for the worse. Temperature control uh, is lost. When you walk from an air-conditioned building into the outside, you take for granted that your body starts accommodating that either by sweating or redirecting blood flow. People with burns, especially horrible, large surface area burns, that's lost forever. They have to plan everything they do. They have to plan where they're going to be and the clothing much more carefully. So there are emotional and physical things both that are lost forever. My medical treatments were quite extensive. Um, I think I'm, I honestly have lost count how many surgeries I had to go through to, to get back to the point where I could fly again, but it's got to be somewhere near 50. Um, including all the skin grafting things that they had to do in the hospital and, and as such. Psychologically, it was, was tough in the beginning. Um, there I was, uh, happy to be finally starting my career as I had dreamed it from my childhood, and it was suddenly ripped away. And that was tough. There was a lot of uh, long nights talking with Amy. Um, 
trying to get over the, the, the pain and despair of all that. I did have trouble getting my life back in order. It, uh, it caused me to drink more than, uh, more than I had before. I think it, the plane crash, it just took the last bite. And I stayed in the fire service for a while after that, but my heart was never in it again. I quit my job as I was a vice president of a software company, traveling a lot, um, making very good money. And I went to work as a buyer in Alaska. I also reconnected with uh, my ex-wife and we got remarried, moved down to South Carolina and had all our kids move in with us. So, yeah, I, I did change my life. It helped me to kind of put a lot of things in perspective, including not only how I acted myself, but also how I treated other people. One year after the crash, the Military Fraternal Organization of Pilots bestowed its prestigious medallion on Matt Warmadam for his part in saving the lives of his passengers. He accepted it in honor of the crew. Seeking closure on the trauma of the crash, residents built a memorial to the victims of Flight 529 behind Shiloh United Methodist Church, a short distance from the accident site in Burwell. You know, I wish this had never happened. I wish I could go back in time and, and fix it and take care of it, that it didn't happen. You know, I don't know if they believe in God or not, but I, I, I pray for them that God comforts them uh, through the hurt that they've had in their lives. Much has changed for the company that manufactured Flight 529's propeller. Now renamed Hamilton Sunstrand, it's part of the giant United Technologies Aerospace and Defense Group. Flight 529 was the last time that one of its propellers failed in flight. Its inspection and repair process was made more stringent, in some cases exceeding FAA requirements. Since the three blade failures, there have been none whatsoever. Of the 29 people aboard ASA Flight 529, only eight escaped with minor injuries. Of the 21 others who received major injuries and burns, 10 subsequently died. Flight attendant Robin Feck declined to be interviewed for this film. Still suffering from the pain and anguish of that terrible day, she's never worked as a flight attendant again. The best thing I ever could have done for myself was that day two years ago when I'd finished training and took the controls of a ASA plane and flew again. I stubbornly recaptured my dream. And now that I'm doing it again, it's, it's just been a joy. It's what I do, it's what I love. It's what I always wanted to do with my life and I'm doing it again. The giant aircraft stands on the tarmac at Marseille in France. It's been taken over by hijackers who are preparing the worst terrorist atrocity the world has so far seen. The men are heavily armed and carrying powerful explosives. The French Prime Minister faces a terrible dilemma. Storm the plane, lose 173 passengers and crew, but let it take off and there'll be an even bigger price to pay. This will become a blueprint for defeating a terrorist hijacking. With eyewitness testimony and video recordings, this is the inside story of the hijacking the world forgot. It's Christmas Eve, 1994. An Air France jet is on final approach to Algiers airport. It's the early morning flight from Paris to this former French colony on the north coast of Africa. The plane is an Airbus A300 with a crew of 12 on board. 
three greens. This is no ordinary landing. Algeria is in a state of civil war. The area around the airport has been the scene of fierce fighting. There's a very real threat of missiles being fired at the plane as it comes in to land. The flights to Algiers are only done by volunteers because of the terrorist threat. We're all aware of it. We accept the risk. So dangerous is it that Air France, the French state airline, has asked its government if it really needs to continue these flights to Algiers. So far, there's been no reply. 100 feet. 50 feet. 20 feet. We got pressed in the The captain of Air France Flight 8969 is Bernard Delem, a highly experienced pilot. This is his first ever television interview. The events are still so threatening to him that he'll only appear in silhouette. There were some security measures, like on any other flight, and a few extra ones since we were in Algiers. But at my level, I had no qualms about flying there. Even now, 10 years later, I can still say that I like doing in Algiers. The plane will only be on the ground for the short time it takes to clean, refuel, and board the passengers for the return flight. They're mostly Algerians, but many are French, escaping for a while the perils of life in Algeria. Three years earlier, Islamic fundamentalists had won the elections there, hoping to install an Islamic state. But then the military seized power and imprisoned their leaders. Since then, Algeria has descended into chaos. Like every other year, I decided to come and spend the holidays in France, and I had a cousin with me. I was chief stewardess at Air Algeria, and I wouldn't take any other flight but Air Algeria normally. But when I arrived at the airport, there were no seats left. The flight was full. But an Air France booking agent suggested that I take the Air France flight. So I did. At least I'd be certain of taking off. Boarding is nearly over, but then, another sign of the fraught security situation, police board the plane for one more check. Presidential police, you two take the rear. Police, nobody move, please. Presidential police, we're carrying out an identity check. Right. No, you stay here, we'll handle it. It'd be best if I made an announcement. Okay, go ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, good day. This is your captain speaking. There will be a short delay while the police will come to their cabin to carry out a passport check. Please remain seated. We apologize for the inconvenience. We should be on our way shortly. Passport. Passport. When they came towards us, they were armed. And that's really unusual. Passports, please. This unauthorized delay to Flight 8969 is making the military suspicious. Algerian special forces, known as the Ninjas, are already heading towards the plane. I looked outside and I could see the Ninjas out there, the Algerian special forces. I said to myself, why are there so many of them? Tarut means infidels. And when he said that, I knew straight away that they were terrorists. There it was. All of you, get to the back! Hurry! Shut that voice of Satan! Sit down! You two, don't move! Nobody move! We are not the police. We are Mujahideen. The men are not police, but terrorists. They belong to a violent group of Muslim extremists. They aim to force an Islamic state on Algeria, no matter what it takes. And seizing the plane is part of that plan. When that happened, it was like a rock falling. Like lead. I don't know which. It was horrifying. Look at this! This is a very powerful bomb! There are others just like it! Ready for a great fireworks show in the sky! We are the Mujahideen of the people! God has chosen us to die, and you to die with us! 
The leader, 25-year-old Abdul Abdullah Yahya, is a notorious killer. There is nothing to fear. God awaits us all in his heavenly paradise. Outside, news spreads quickly, and reporters arrive at the scene. In Paris, the French Prime Minister is urgently recalled from his Christmas holiday. It's an international crisis. I spent the whole afternoon on the phone trying to find out exactly what was going on. It was pretty confused. The Algerian authorities were determined to get tough, and it was difficult to discuss the problem with them. Give me your jacket, Captain. Back in Algiers, the terrorists decide to put on the flight crew's uniforms to confuse any army snipers. Meanwhile, in the cabin, one of the terrorists is not happy with what he sees. Cover your head. Cover your head more. You too. Their Islamic customs were not being respected. Men and women sharing the same toilets, sitting next to each other. And above all, women with their heads uncovered. That was intolerable for Lotfi, and it threw him into a rage. Lotfi's character is very peculiar. We called him the madman because really he was always on a knife edge. He had fits of rage. He was always on the brink of fury. What he saw there in the cabin was intolerable for him. He had to cover these women up. Now, two hours into the hijacking, the terrorists want to talk to the Algerian military. You in the tower. We have taken control of this Air France flight. We are the armed Islamic group. Do you hear me? Do you understand? Do you hear me? What is wrong with this thing? They don't hear me. They couldn't hear you because you both talked at the same time. You have to start again. You tell them. Do it. Air France 8969. What do you want me to say? The terrorists order Captain Belem to take off for Paris. They say they're going to hold a press conference there. But the plane can't move. The passenger boarding stairs are still attached. And the Algerian authorities have parked vehicles to block the runways. Air France 8969. The passenger boarding stairs are still in place. Please remove them immediately. They meet with a blank refusal. Things are starting to go wrong for the hijackers. The Algerian strategy is not to give way on a single point, but it's a dangerous policy, as they are soon to find out. We are going to blow up the world! We are going to blow up the plane and everyone in! Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Armed terrorists have hijacked an Air France jet at Algiers airport. They want to leave for Paris, but the government won't let them. It's a stalemate for the moment. I'll say it one more time. Please remove the boarding stairs so that we can leave for Paris. You think we are joking? We will show you how we are joking. We are soldiers of God. We are ready to die. We will show them. The terrorists are about to send a message to the Algerian government. During the passport check, they've identified among the passengers an officer of the Algerian police. Then two rows behind me, there was a policeman. Can you come with us, please? We need your help. He asked the policeman to follow him. It's crazy. I don't know if he knew. But he was very hesitant. He was walking, but reluctantly, because he didn't know what was going to happen to him. Open the door, please. So please take our message to the government. Few passengers are aware of the murder, nor are the pilots.
The first contact we were allowed with the cabin was when a stewardess was allowed into the cockpit to see if we wanted anything. I said, we'd like a glass of water, because it was hard to swallow, as you can imagine. Our throats were very dry. Just then, she whispered to me, they've already killed a passenger. I was dumbfounded, because we had no idea. We'd heard nothing. But the passengers are growing more concerned about what's going on outside. There are signs that the Algerian special forces are preparing for an armed assault. The biggest worry that we all had was that the ninjas, the Algerian special forces, would attack the plane. Things were going on inside the plane, sure, but anything that would come from the outside would upset things, and that scared us. As French interior minister at the time, Charles Pasqua knows exactly how the ninjas operate. They were trained by us. We were taking a considerable risk by letting this plane stay in Algiers, because we knew that although the Algerian forces were perfectly capable of ending the siege, it would have ended in a bloodbath. The Algerian military maintain their hard line, so the terrorists are about to raise the stakes again. Another passenger must die. When they came for the second passenger, we knew things were going wrong. This passenger, he was different. He was Vietnamese, a diplomat. He was the real foreigner on this plane. This passenger was not cowed by their terror and that must have bothered them. The Vietnamese diplomat believes that as an outsider, he's being released. Stewardess went back to the cabin and came back with a bottle of water and some glasses. She served us and whispered, it's not one now, it's two. Immediately, I realized that we had really hit the jackpot. As the hours go by, the crew and passengers begin to recognize the different personalities of the four men. To make things simpler, we gave them names. Yaya gave us his name straight away, so that was easy. He was in charge. He looked a little bit like a student. He was friendly enough, very calm, except when he flew into a rage, and then he would act like a gangster. Lotfi, the madman, was the one who insisted we follow their laws, the one who was the most fanatic, the most fundamentalist. He'd already been in prison and been tortured. He had a hatred of the government, and he had a very short fuse. He was the dangerous one, the real psychopath. The third one didn't have a name. We called him Bill. He was a little bit simple. You wondered what he was doing there, and you could see him wondering the same thing. It was an error in casting. He was more of a goat herd than a terrorist. Then, finally, there was the killer. It was he who did the shooting, and who cleaned his gun afterwards without any remorse or feeling. I wonder if he knew what he was doing. The killer in the group is becoming increasingly bizarre. The tallest one, the killer. When we passed each other on the plane, he would take me by the neck and kiss me on the forehead. And later on, the meaning of this was more or less confirmed to me. People told me that this could be seen as the kiss of death. Finally, Morin plucks up enough courage to voice his fears. Can I say something? I, uh, <clears throat> I want to ask you a favor. I have a few. 
If, if you decide to kill me, I, I want you to, to promise me that I don't want to be killed by a bullet in the back because when I die, I, I want to be able to see your face. What are you afraid of? Well, it's, it's impossible not to be afraid with, with what's going on on the plane. I don't need to worry. Because if I kill you, you will be a martyr. You will go straight to paradise. I can tell you that it didn't make me feel any better. In Algiers, it's stalemate. Neither side is giving way. In Paris, the French leaders are frustrated. They believe their own special forces could bring the hijacking to a safe end. But the Algerians refused to let foreign troops in to sort out an Algerian problem. I asked the Algerian authorities extremely forcefully and urgently to let the plane take off because I considered that it was a French plane belonging to Air France which, although it had on board a majority of Algerians, had dozens of French there too. So it was for us to solve the problem. Night falls. Air France Flight 8969 is pinned down by spotlights. The passengers have now been held hostage for seven hours. Initial panic has given way to a tense calm Few realize that two passengers have been murdered. The crew is working hard to defuse the situation. All these buttons, like uh, here, for instance, it's uh, the APU, auxiliary power unit. The role of a crew in these conditions is to keep things calm, to earn trust, to keep things going, which is very important. At the start of a hostage taking, it's always violent. You have to buy time to calm people, to show what you're like, to find out who they are, and so on. And then try to gain their trust. <coughs> there was the conversion to Islam of two stewardesses, of whom I was one. It was a request from the terrorists. I don't have any disrespect for believers, but if it could help calm the terrorists down, then I didn't have any problem faking a conversion. We are going to blow up the world! We are going to blow up the plane and everyone in it! Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Through the night, the threats and ultimatums continue. But the Algerian government will not give in. It's a battle of wills. At one point, it was quite calm. I made a tour of the cabin about two in the morning. There were two of them lying on the floor, between door one left and door one right. I thought, look, two of them are asleep, one's at the rear, there's only one in the cockpit. If an assault took place now, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. But that's as far as it went. After a restless night, the passengers wake up. It's Christmas morning. It was a marvelous gesture. There was one person we called Father Christmas because he said, you've worked hard enough, now it's my turn. And he took round all the bottles of water and glasses to the passengers. The passengers joined in. That's to say they tried to eat something, to do normal things to make the atmosphere a little bit more normal and a little less stressful than it really was. It was the waiting, because in reality, we could do nothing but wait. During the night, the French government has decided to send its special forces to the island of Mallorca, as close to Algeria as possible, without being accused of interfering. 
Colonel Denis Favier was then a major in charge of the French counter-terrorist unit, the GGN. Since the hijacking, it's feared that terrorists have put a price on his head, and he doesn't want his face to be seen. The decision was taken to send GIGN to Mallorca. An Air France aircraft was put at our disposal, identical in every respect to the hijacked aircraft, as well as an experienced crew who knew the technical side, all the details of the plane. En route to Mallorca, Major Favier's men have familiarized themselves with every detail of the A300 Airbus, in the expectation that they will get the chance to attack the plane. Back in Algiers, the terrorists release some passengers, mainly women with young children or people with serious medical conditions. But there are still over 170 people on board, a handful for the four young terrorists. And the passengers are not who they thought they would be. I don't know how the terrorists organized their business. They certainly put a lot of thought into it. They obviously wanted to seize a symbol of France, and Air France is a national symbol. But perhaps they didn't realize that in an Air France plane at Algiers, most of the passengers would be Algerians. 138 of the passengers are Algerian citizens. The terrorists offer to release them, leaving only the French nationals on board. A gruesome indication, perhaps, of their final plan. However, the Algerian passengers refuse to leave. It's true that in Algiers they were going to free some of the passengers, and they refused to get off. I think that one of them said, if we leave, then afterwards they're going to kill the crew, so I'm going to stay. I think that this man was sincere. I can't explain it, but it was the truth. The Algerian government has another trick up its sleeve. They've managed to identify the terrorist leader, Yahya, and bring his mother to the microphone to try to weaken her son's resolve. Ma! Ma! I love you, but I love God more! The Algerian government's tactic misfires. It sends Yahya into a boiling rage. They went and got my mother. Can you imagine that? My mother! They went and dragged my mother over here! How many friends are back there? Uh, one man and woman. Go get the man. What do they think they're playing at? What do they think they're doing? He was furious. He had no intention of changing his mind. Even the love of his mother, even his mother couldn't do anything. Until now, the terrorists haven't targeted any French citizens. But their time has come. Two staff members of the French embassy are on board, a secretary and a young chef. OK, now we will teach you how to play games with us. Are you listening to me? You tell them that if they don't let the plane take off, we will kill every single passenger one by one. Tell them. My name is Yannick Beunier. I work at the embassy. They're threatening to kill us. If you do nothing, they'll start the executions. You've got to do something, and quickly, quick as you can. We care nothing for you. We are soldiers of God. We'll kill him and we'll throw him outside the door. You can come and pick him up. Get me a magazine. He was terrified, Yannick. He was looking at me, but he was terrified. Was he pleading with me to help him? Was he? You two, we better off going back to your places. Go! Oh! I was saying to myself, no, it's not possible. It can't happen like this. It's not possible. Confirms that the terrorists have carried out their threat. Air France 8969. You happy now? See what you get when you play tough. On a assisté à distance. We witnessed at a distance the execution of this man. 
It was something we lived through with great emotion in Paris, because we were patched into the conversations between the plane and the control tower. The French government can no longer stand by and do nothing. Prime Minister Balladur gets on the phone and threatens his Algerian counterpart. I told him that I would hold the Algerian government responsible for what happened and make it known to international opinion. Balladur's threat works. The Algerian president caves in. Finally, after 39 hours of terror, Flight 8969 can leave for France. Just then, there it was. We could leave. In the plane, there was a joy you could not imagine. And really, this impression that that was it. We'd succeeded. We had all succeeded, and we were going to be saved. We were leaving Algiers. But there's a problem. All the time they've been on the ground, the captain has kept the auxiliary power unit running. It's a small jet engine in the tail of the plane, which keeps the power supply going. It uses around four tons of fuel a day. Now there isn't enough to reach Paris. Only Marseille on the southern coast of France. Navigation lights on. Air conditioning packs. Flight 8969 prepares to take off. The crew are relieved to be going home. Both they and the passengers believe that whatever the future holds, it can't be as bad as what they're leaving behind. They don't realize the horror that awaits them. After two days of terror and the death of three passengers, the Algerian authorities are allowing Flight 8969 to leave for France. The terrorists say they're going to hold a press conference there. Before takeoff checklist completed. But Captain Delem wants an urgent word with the terrorist leader. What is it? What's wrong? Look. Since the start of this whole thing, I followed your instructions. You want to get to Paris to talk to the journalists. I'll take you there. But I want to know if you're going to blow up the plane between Algiers and Marseille. Why do you ask if I'm going to blow up the plane? Because the responsibility for these passengers is on my shoulders. No, there's nothing to worry about for you or the passengers. We fly to Marseille, like you said, refuel the tanks, and then we go to Paris. I give you my word. Good. Let's go. Me, I believed them when they told me that the plane would not be blown up between Algiers and Marseille. I don't know if they would have given me the same answer between Marseille and Paris. When someone's got explosives, they're not for making a birthday cake. Two terrorists strapped in their seats in the cockpit, and they're so excited. They're like kids, excited, happy. What's more, they've succeeded. At 3.30 in the morning on the 26th of December, the plane approaches Marseille airport. They're unaware that Major Denis Favier and his French special forces have got there ahead of them from Mallorca and are now planning a showdown. Normally, you arrive on ground that's held by the enemy. But here, it's the enemy who is going to arrive on ground where you are in total control. And that's a key element in the success of the operation. 50 feet. 20 feet. For the terrorists, it's the magic moment. We are landing in France. We'll get fuel. We'll get provisions to take off again and go to Paris, because that's the objective. The airport is very dark. There are the lights of the plane and the little car, the follow me car, which we follow. And we do not go to the terminal. The plane is being deliberately led away to a remote corner of the airfield. Tension is very high, because the French government has received some alarming news. While the plane was flying towards France, 
we received other information, according to which the terrorists plan to use the plane to carry out an attack on Paris. The information was credible, and we took it seriously. So the decision was made that no matter what, the plane would not take off from Marseille. No matter how high the price may be, the plane would not take off. We picked a very precise spot for the plane to park, and then we just played for time. The French tactics will now be dictated by Major Favier. His plan is to wear the terrorists down. Whilst always appearing conciliatory, the French will spin out negotiations as long as possible. They know that Yahya and his men must be tired. The hijacking has now gone on for almost two days. Air France 8969, we require immediate refueling. 27 tons. 27 tons. The terrorists have learned from the flight crew that 27 tons of fuel will fill the tanks, far more than the nine tons needed for the journey to Paris. It appears to confirm the intelligence report that the plane is to be used as a firebomb. They say it's not possible uh, because of the killings, because of what happened in Algiers. It's in all the papers. The workers who do the refueling are afraid. They won't come near the plane. Tell them we want to go now. We'll do a press conference in Paris. Air France 8969, they want to leave for Paris right away. They wish to hold a press conference in Paris. They say, why go to Paris while all the international press has come here to Marseille? They're all here. Why do a press conference in Paris? There's no point. We can do it here on the plane. Major Favier has baited the hook. Will Yahya bite? Tell them we want CNN. Tell them we want CNN. Air France 8969, they want to speak to CNN. The terrorists agree to a press conference aboard the plane, little realizing that it's all part of a clever plan. Tactically, this press conference was important because it enabled us to get some of the passengers moved to the rear of the plane. The negotiators ask that the front of the plane be cleared for the press conference. The real reason is to create a clear area for the French special forces when they storm the plane. Because what the terrorists don't realize is that the plane's doors can be opened from the outside. Are they coming? No, not yet. By now, the plane has been sitting on Marseille's taxiway for 12 hours. The French special forces know how many terrorists there are and where they are. It's believed the French special forces planted microphones on the fuselage of the plane. Now they're waiting for the sun to go down to take advantage of the dark. On the plane, they know nothing of this. They're still waiting for the press to arrive. Tower 8969. Everything's ready here. You can send the press now. Eight nine six nine. What? What do, you, what do you mean they're not ready? No, 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 no. You said they were ready over an hour ago, and you were going to get them. Come on, there's not much time left. There must be hundreds of journalists there. This will be the biggest scoop of their careers. They're up to something. We can't stay here. I assure you, it's, it's, it's... Captain, move the plane over there. I promise you, we'll be... Fine. Captain, move it right now. Do it. Move I, the plane over I there where the other ones are. We'll be fine. I, I promise. Move the planes! Go over there where the other ones are! Do it! Do it! Let's go. Start engines. Suddenly, all Colonel Favier's plans are in disarray. Yahya, the terrorist leader, now has the initiative. Tactically for us, the situation was very bad. Our positions were based on the plane being parked at point A, 
and all of a sudden it's at point B. So we have to reorganize very quickly. Captain Delem is forced to park right at the foot of the tower, close to the terminal and other flights. If they blow up the plane now, the casualties could be enormous. Tell them it's too late now! There won't be a press conference, it's too late, it should have been done! Tell them to fill the tanks, we're leaving! They have until five o'clock, at five o'clock, we're taking off! Tell them, Captain, do it! I've had it, do it! Air Force 8969. Major Favier is having his men picked up as fast as possible to move to new positions. He puts snipers on the terminal roof, where they'll have a view of the cockpit. He only has a few minutes to set up his emergency plan, a cavalry charge of passenger boarding stairs. Three air stairs and 30 men. This is the plan. Penetrate by the two rear doors, with two teams of 11 men each at the rear right and rear left doors, and then a penetration by a smaller team of eight men at the front right door to gain control of the cockpit, since we know that the terrorist leader is in the cockpit. Our intention is to cut off the cockpit from the rest of the plane. By five o'clock, no fuel has been delivered. The authorities have no intention of allowing the plane to take off. Five o'clock comes yeah. round, and there, it's the moment when Yaya has to do something. Yaya enters the cabin to choose his fourth victim, but he seems reluctant. He chooses a member of the crew, the youngest, the most foreign, who had made the mistake of telling him he was an atheist. this, but I got no choice. I don't know what was going on in Yaya's head, and we never will. I don't know if he changed his mind, but he kept putting off this execution. So instead of that, he fired on everything around. The hijackers know they are in the end game. But then they discovered there was a public address and they started reciting verses from the Quran. It was very difficult because it was the prayers for the dead. We had to prepare ourselves for death. We were going to die as martyrs. God was waiting for us. There was silence, and all of a sudden, it was a state of panic. The terrorists know the French negotiators are in the control tower. They decide to send them a message. One of the terrorists opened the side window of the cockpit and hosed down the control tower. The glass shattered all around us. We were literally machine gunned. Since we had landed in Marseille, there had been some moments of tension, but nothing like what seemed to be about to happen. We're going to succeed in our mission, Captain. Don't worry about that. Major Favier has been given carte blanche by the French Prime Minister, Edouard Balladur. He decides the moment has come to act. When the terrorists started firing with an automatic weapon on the tower, there was danger inside the plane, so we now had justification for an armed attack. That attack was carried out from the air stairs, which are mobile vehicles. <laughs> At that moment, everybody understood, them and us, that it was the beginning of the assault. The cavalry charge is underway. This is actual footage of the attack. There are eight of us on the front right air stair. The first air stair gets to the aircraft. There's a small problem with the height, as it was a little bit higher than the, than the door. The door hits the top of the air stair, a slight step back, the door opens, the air stair touches the plane, and the group goes in. Then it's the apocalypse. Get down! Get down! 
And then the group that has gone in comes under a deluge of fire from the terrorists who shoot at everyone who enters, an extremely murderous fire. There's not a moment's doubt about the nature of this gunfire. They are shooting to kill. At the rear of the plane, the other two squads of Favier's men enter. So I hear, hands on your head, don't move, hide, get down as low as you can. I just wish to escape. The situation we were in was extremely violent, so I pulled the overcoat I had over my head so I wouldn't see the tracer bullets whizzing past, nor what was going on around. Hundreds of bullets are whistling through the cabin. Grenades are exploding. There's smoke and confusion everywhere. I was in a rather bad spot, so I tried to make myself as small as possible. You stop breathing, and you imagine that you're hard enough to stop the bullets. The snipers on the terminal roof can see the terrorists in the cockpit, but frustratingly can't get a clear shot. The co-pilot is blocking their view. But that problem is about to be solved. Actual video footage shows the co-pilot, Jean-Paul Bordery, falling onto the hard concrete. Yet he still manages to stagger away to safety. It gives the snipers the chance they've been waiting for. At the rear of the cabin, the French Special Forces is evacuating the passengers through a hail of gunfire. But cabin steward Christophe Morin finds himself unable to escape. I tried to take with me a woman, a passenger who had been sitting next to me, but she was too fat, she could not come. So we just held hands. Unbelievably, only a few minutes after the assault began, most of the passengers have been rescued. By now, only one terrorist is left alive, but he's going down fighting. There was only the flight engineer and me left in the cockpit. We looked at each other, and there's just this one terrorist. He looks at us, one after the other. His three colleagues are here, dead or nearly so. Out of spite, he could have killed both of us. He didn't. What more can I say? I think that after 54 hours, there is mutual recognition and respect, quote-unquote, between the terrorists and the hostages. Yes, bonds were created in this drama. And I think these bonds were activated and that they perhaps contributed to saving the lives of some members of the crew. The French news footage captures amazing scenes of the battle. A GGN man is blasted out of the plane by gunshots. The final surviving terrorist holds them at bay for almost 20 minutes, but his time and his ammunition are running out. The flight engineer and I looked at each other. We knew exactly the situation we were in. As long as there were gunshots, we knew we could die. But once it stopped, or when we thought it had stopped, then we said, all right, it's over. But it's not over yet for the captain and his flight engineer. The GGN are not sure who were the terrorists and how many are still alive. Everyone is suspect. The battle around the cockpit has been so fierce that everyone believes the flight crew are dead. The French special forces suspect that any survivors may be terrorists in disguise. The flight engineer is hustled off the plane and handcuffed. Get up. Hands on your head. I'm the captain of the plane. Now we'll get out. Not with my hands on my head. I would never have left the cockpit with my hands on my head. After all I had been through, I would not be punished like a child. When we saw Bernard and Alain come out, we couldn't believe it. Alain was handcuffed and his shirt was covered in blood. He said, I'm deaf, I'm deaf. But we said, yes, but you're alive. 
We told them, he's our flight engineer, let him go. It was incredible. For 20 minutes, the gun battle has raged on board the crowded aircraft. Hundreds of shots have been fired, numerous grenades exploded. Yet all 173 passengers and crew have survived. Captain Delem himself escaped with bullet wounds to his right elbow and thigh. The crew had a specific responsibility, the duty to save the hostages and to safeguard the plane. The crew in general and the captain in particular, they all rose to the occasion. Nine of the 30 GGN men have been wounded, one seriously. When I assessed the gravity of the GIGN men's injuries, and when we learned that none were fatal, then yes, I could consider that the operation overall had been a success. Out of the 161 passengers who survived the hijacking, only a few have suffered slight injuries. A huge relief to the French Prime Minister. I cannot say that I was calm that day, but I considered that there was no other decision to be made than the one I took. So the only thing that was left for me was to hope that things would unfold well. And as a matter of fact, they unfolded exceptionally well. I would not have dreamed that they would go that well. All the French special forces and the crew members received high national honors for their courage. For a long time, I kept seeing the faces of the three dead passengers that I couldn't save. Then, when the time of the medals came, I realized that I had helped save 170 people. It's a lot more gratifying, and it allowed me to mourn and get over it. I don't wear the medal, but I'm proud of having it, and I consider that we deserved it. We only did what we were supposed to, our job. It was a textbook mission, one of the most successful anti-terrorist operations ever carried out. But the traumatic experience will never leave the survivors. Zahida Kakachi, the passenger, could not stay in Algeria. She became so anxious about her safety, she emigrated to France. Stewardess Claude Bourgnard was thanked by Air France, but never worked for them again. Christophe Morin suffered the same fate. Since this horrific experience, his outlook on life has changed radically. He now works for a charitable organization. Captain Delem eventually returned to flying duties. After a further nine years of service, he's recently retired from Air France. Later, a former leader of the Algerian terrorist groups, Omar Chiki, confirmed that the plan had been to blow up the plane over the Eiffel Tower, the symbol of the French nation. Hundreds might have been killed when the plane crashed down onto the crowded streets of Paris. They never tried again, and the world would forget this hijacking. Until seven years later, I went to do some shopping and I bumped into a friend who said, a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. I went home and stayed sitting in front of the television for 24 hours. I couldn't move or eat or do anything. All those images came back to me and I asked myself, is that what was supposed to happen to us? I was convinced that the terrorists wanted to crash the plane over Paris. To them, it would have been a great feat. Crashing a plane on the Eiffel Tower or the Elysee Palace would be an extraordinary feat. Above all, I kept thinking, we had apprentice terrorists, boys who didn't understand very well what they were doing. But voila, they taught everyone a lesson.